Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader User Group, a weekly roundup for the trade week ending March 4th, 2022. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. This week's theme is global uncertainty, but we've had that since the Russians moved in to Ukraine on uh, February 24th. Actually, they've been massing on the borders well before then, but they moved in on the 24th. But let's just kind of take a look at where we are where this past week is and just kind of what the charts are starting to shape up for. So if we look at the uh, index performance for the week, you can see everybody's in the green. Markets ended lower this week, very volatile week. Investors are pretty much weighing the developments in the crisis in Ukraine. VIX reached his highest point in over a year. And we're getting a lot of day-to-day -day price fluctuations pretty wide, which is not uncommon when the VIX gets over 30 but it's continuing to baffle a lot of traders um, as the price action tends to fluctuate based on what and when and how and where the news coming out of Ukraine or Russia uh, continues to turn more south. You can see the weekly performance of all the U.S. indexes solidly in the red, year-to-date solidly in the red. Now, this is year-to-date numbers um, from the all-time highs. It's lower than that for the Russell and NASDAQ. For the year, though, we're in official correction territory. For both NASDAQ and Russell, very close for the S&P and the Dow is bringing up the rear. You can see the best performers. Uh, it's probably not a shock to everybody for the week. Energy for the year, energy for the uh, week. For worst performers, financials with the yield curve flattening <coughs> or getting more flat. And discretionary is also really bad um, for the year, down 16.06%. So you're seeing consumers, while spending strong, they're spending um, not indiscriminately, but they're they're withholding their paychecks for uh, certain uh, discretionary items like big screen TVs, jet skis, and things like that. Okay, um, we're seeing also domestic policy events, um, meaning economic data is kind of taking a secondary role in shaping near-term market sentiment, which again shouldn't surprise everybody is that day-to-day -day news fluctuates coming out of uh, Ukraine with Russia's uh, invasion. Um, one thing we did get that markets were kind of well tuned into was um, Fed Chair uh, Jerome Power Ranger, Boom Boom Powell, as we like to call him, in his congressional testimony uh, Wednesday, the U.S. Congress, Thursday to the Senate, when he said that um, he's basically too early to say if the Russian invasion would change the Fed's policy over medium term. But he did say they're going to move more carefully. So he did say they're inclined to stick to the 25 basis point rate hike uh, this coming March, uh, in the next, not this coming week, but the week after, versus the market had originally put in a 50 basis point rate hike. So that tends to be more of a dovish comment from um, Boom Boom Powell. So that tended to help the markets midweek, but it really couldn't erase a weekly down move. Okay. So his comments were taken more dovish than hawkish. And then on Friday, we got really great economic data from the Labor Department showing that employers added 678,000 jobs in the month of February, well above consensus, which was around 400,000. And we did see also um, average hourly earnings remain fairly steady. Didn't have a 50 basis point rate increase or increase in hours, uh, hour, uh, <laughs> average hourly earnings. Uh, we did get the ISM gauge factory activity in February indicating kind of slowing growth um, also. So, but net net on the wage gains, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we are seeing wage gains falling behind inflation. So the real uh, wage is going down, you know, and then consumers are going to slowly start closing off that pocketbook. And keep in mind that's 70% of the U.S. GDP. So that's one of the other risks that are floating around out there. Okay. So, and then in the uh, bond market, uh, we're seeing the risk off environment, um, uh, obviously pushing the 10 year benchmark treasury yield to the lowest level it's had in the last couple of months. Okay. We're seeing uh, corporate bond markets weakening just a little bit on deteriorating economic sentiment. But all in all, it's really not in the credit markets, which is what you really want to follow very closely, which is an indication of where the equity markets are going. It's showing some fear, but not panic at this point in time. Okay. 
Now, of course, if we come over and um, if we look at uh, the European markets, you can see we got rid of that last bit of green for the FTSE. And look at the weekly returns. The euro stocks down over 10% for the week. The FTSE, 6%. CAC 40, over 10. DAX, over 10. Those are huge. Those are annual numbers, but they hit for the week. Um, and primary reason, of course, is uh, the Ukraine is in the European Union's um, eastern or uh, eastern backyard, right? So they're obviously going to be a lot more affected than the U.S. markets, although the U.S. markets will be affected not as much as uh, European Union. Okay, year to date, you can see the euro stocks down huge. Same thing with CAC 40 and the DAX. The FTSE is not in correction territory yet, but all the others are close to a bear market uh, on this. And you can see that the investor sentiment is weighing very heavy across all of Europe. Uh, Eurozone bonds also declined in a very volatile week um, as well. And we did see towards the end of this week, the EU, UK, and the U.S. imposing huge sanctions on Russia, including removing them from the uh, SWIFT payment system, at least most of the banks, not all of them, but most of them, except for some of the majors that move oil. So um, it, that is going to, uh, and that, by the way, caused the Russian markets to decline 90%, and then they've been closed after that, and they still haven't opened the rest of this past week. Okay, now when they do open, I'm sure it's gonna be very ugly. But that's kind of what happened there. The ECB also appeared to signal a change in their tone on monetary policy, right? Which means they're going to be a little bit softer during this time of crisis. Meanwhile, just like in the U.S., inflation in the eurozone uh, accelerated to a record 5.8 percent, which is up from 5.1 percent in January. So, um, at some point, it's going to force the ECB, like here in the U.S., to start raising the rates. Okay, now. In the Asian markets, Japanese government also jumped in on the sanctions with Russia, coordinating their actions with the SWIFT uh, uh, agreement and also um, all the other sanctions that are coming up um, in, in Japan. So, But you can see the Japanese markets also took a hit. They're almost in correction territory year to date. And then finally, um, if we look at uh, Hang Sen in China, China was barely down, but they're down ugly uh, this year already. In fact, the Chinese People's Bank of China, I guess, see the P PBOC, why they call it the People's Bank, it's a, it's a socialist communist thing to do. You call everything after the people, even though the people have nothing to do with it. But the People's Bank of China basically is talking about adding more stimulus to the economy. Um, China is we're supposed to announce their official 2022 GDP target of five to five and a half percent. Um, and that's going to be the first time since 1991 that their official target is going to be below six percent. Okay. So China's feeling it really tough right now um, all across uh, the Chinese markets. And their economic news, they're at factory activity, which was below 50, expanded slightly above 50 to come in February at 50.4. Remember, 50 is the, the dividing line between an expansionary and a contractionary environment. So they close that out uh, at 50.4 for February. So, But all in all, the markets look fairly ugly, guys. Uh, let me show you the charts here in just one second. Let me flip over. We're going to start, as we always do, with the S&P uh, E-mini futures. So when we look at this uh, report here, you're going to see that <clears throat> um, on these, I mean, look at this pattern here. Um, just a very wide pattern. This is a daily chart. And you can see we've gone nowhere really since the uh, closing on uh, 24 Feb. And keep in mind that Russia officially invaded Ukraine when they rolled tanks across the border, especially in the north coming out of Belarus, on February 24th. 
And since then, the daily range has been very wide, which is why the VIX is also very high. But at the net net, we've just stayed in this range. We cannot get over that yellow line, which is the 200 EMA. And you can see the 50 EMA has got a downward vector. So if we stay below that, eventually the 50 EMA will cross over the 200 EMA, which is known as a death cross. This is this chart looks like the beginnings of a bear market. And unless we get a positive correction and hold with volume or supported by volume to the upside, then I see more downside ahead. Okay. In fact, what I'm telling our members is near term, we could move higher. But going out through the remaining part of March into April, the risk of the bigger move is to the downside. In fact, I'm calling that we take out this downside low for the year of 14.69% from the all time highs, which is around 4,101. And I see a range on the upper end of 4,100 and the lower end of 3,800. Okay. Um, and that would put us not quite in bear market, but pretty darn close. Okay. And this is the E mini S and P. Um, and you could just see this range here. We got to, in, in a typical bear market, folks, markets move about four times faster than they do in a um, bullish market. Okay. Um, and in a bearish market, just like a bullish market, you can have a counter cyclical move. So in a bearish market, um, you can have a counter cyclical move to the upside and it typically runs into resistance at either the 200 and or the 50 before sellers come in and push it back down again. So we're going to be watching this very close. So this is the 50 uh, EMA, the red line, and then the yellow line is the 200. You can see the downward vector on the 50 EMA. That does not look that good. Okay. Um, and we're just not able to get the volume to get up above here. Okay. Now, one other thing I'll show you, and we'll go take a look at volume here. You can see volume as we've been moving sideways since um, the 25th. Remember, they came in on the 24th of February, which was when the war officially started. Um, although you could probably argue it's been going on longer than that. But when they put tanks across the border here, we've been running in this sideways position. But you can look at uh, volume initially shot up, and then it just fell off the table. So another way that markets can consolidate is over time. They can consolidate over price, uh, find a price point and then move higher and bounce off of it or bounce lower. But they can also consolidate over time. So as we build up here, we're going to break this range. Right now, the odds favor a downside break. If we do break up, I'm going to want to see it followed by strong volume. Right? You can see this move here and this move here. The purple line moved over the blue line, which is a five EMA of a 20 EMA, essentially one week's average volume over a, a monthly average volume uh, of volume, actually. And you can see it moved up here and then it's just it's now we're in a consolidation phase and you can see volume comes down. So that's a good sign that we could be consolidating for a move higher. But even if we move higher, unless we take out that 50 EMA and we test it, and it's supported and we have follow through, then I think the odds favor a downside. We could take out the 200, but we got to get above the 50, okay? Now, if we look at the Dow, the Dow is also the other one here. Um, and if you look at the volume, the charts look the same on the volume, all right? But if you look at this sideways pattern, we're much further south of the 200 EMA and the 50 has got a sharper downward vector than the uh, S&P. And the 200 is slowly starting to move lower as well, okay? So this tells me that this is a more bearish looking chart than the S&P. Um, and you can see here that this sideways move still looks like it wants to go lower, but we are still in this consolidation pattern here, okay? Um, now, I'm gonna show you some charts that look a lot uglier. Let's look at NASDAQ, the NASDAQ 100, which are 100 of the largest uh, companies in NASDAQ. Notice we had the cross in the 50 and the 200 here back on March 1st, the beginning of March. Again, a very bearish sign on a chart going out four to six months. That is a bearish chart, folks, um, meaning a bear market chart, even though we're not officially in a bear market yet because the, the lows from the all-time highs 
uh, we were down here in the uh, official bear market back here on um, February 24th. Uh, and then we just got to move up. If we come back down again, we can move back into a bear market on the NASDAQ 100 futures. That's 100 of the largest uh, tech companies in NASDAQ. Okay. And if we take out 13,000, I think we're going to, I'm going to think we're going to see this go a lot lower. Okay. Um, but again, bear market looking chart. I would expect if we do get a run up, I'm going to look to see if we get up over the 50 and then the 200 without rolling over. I want to see it supported by volume, volume and then I want to see follow through. We don't get any of those. We're rolling back over, guys. Bear market. Um, if we look at the Russell, I believe it looks even worse. Okay. If we look at the rut, you can see in the rut we were down 23.48%. Um, on the morning, the Russians rolled in and then volume came back up and then we're in this, this no man's land. You can see here on the Russell that we had the cross back in the middle of January. Now with our members, I was pointing out our breath went bearish the middle of January, all right, market breath, short, medium and long-term market breath. Pretty much in um, the second to third week in January, everything was all red and we were, we were signaling to go more short than long or go more to cash. Uh, remember the Russell typically leads the market out of a bull into a bear and it typically leads the market out of a bear into a bull. So the Russell is down, was down 23.48% and it's close to being in a bear market here. And you could also see the all time highs in the Russell were made on November the 8th. So it started going down a lot earlier, okay? Um, and if we look at the NASDAQ, the all-time highs on NASDAQ were uh, made here on November 22nd. So towards the end of the first week of November to the third week of November, um, Russell fell first and then NASDAQ 100, okay? On a fear of higher uh, uh, interest rates, higher inflation, but well before the uh, uh, Russians, um, you know, there was even talk of a possible invasion uh, into um, uh, Ukraine, okay? So you can see all of these things here. Now, if we look at the S&P, um, we come back up and look at the S&P. The all-time highs on the S&P, guys, were made here on January 4th of this year. So you can see the order in the all-time highs. We first got Russell, and then we got NASDAQ, and now we got the S&P the last time it saw an all-time high. This fits the classic case of ending a bull market and turning into a bear. We're not there yet. We are on uh, the Russell and very close to it on NASDAQ 100, but we're not there yet on the S&P and the Dow. And of course, if we look at the Dow and look at their last all-time high, the last all-time high on the Dow was January 5th. So early this year, January 4th, January 5th, we had the all-time highs in the Dow and the S&P, and we haven't seen it since. So these markets are um, certainly for NASDAQ and the Russell looking very bearish. And for these other two, they're moving in that direction. So the odds favor if we do get a break higher, don't just go, OK, uh, the bullish lamp is lit. Let's go all bullish. You can play that cyclical move to the upside, but be ready for a rollover unless we get follow through volume uh, at these key uh, moving average levels. OK. Um, and of course, if we look at volatility, uh, it's a very easy one to, to figure out, right? I mean, if we look at the VIX, you can see we're well north and we're in the red of what is considered market and correction territory range, typically for this range here in the VIX, okay? Uh, we're, and you can just see we've steadily moved higher, okay? On February 24th, Right here, you can see the minute the Russians moved in, the VIX moved up really high on that day and then closed at the lows, all right? That's a bearish candle, and sure enough, the very next day, vol continued to fall, but the minute the fireworks started going off, the VIX came back up again, okay? And the rhetoric really, rhetoric, uh, really increased by both sides, um, and then here we are right now, okay? And of course, if we look at treasuries, well, no doubt there was a flock to safety. So in the bond market, you can see here, price just went up and almost came up to the 2021 close. We're still in the red for the year for bonds because 
markets are expecting interest rates to increase. But as you guys have heard me say over and over again, any rise up in this area here, I'm more interested in selling bonds than buying them. The only thing that's keeping me from going short bonds right now is we could have another shoe drop over in the Ukraine. Okay, and what would that shoe be if NATO gets involved and it becomes a shooting war with a NATO country and Russia, then that signals a potential World War Three potential. And then we can see the um, all markets move down 10 percent for the week, at least at least in the next two or three days once that signal hits. So that's the risk in the market. And it's, it's as I tell our members, it's like trying to guess during a sobriety checkpoint on the highway. You're watching the drunk doing the sobriety check and you're trying to guess which side of the yellow line he's going to fall over on. You do not know. It is a coin toss. Same thing here. The risk are very high that that could happen. Um, but uh, the markets are just kind of holding off right now and things can go smooth and all of a sudden we get a miscalculation and away we go. So what I recommend to all beginner and first time traders or you've been trading for a little bit, maybe you're kind of intermediate, you're, you're getting into options a little bit more. Um, I would stay heavily in cash and take your profits a lot quicker than normal if you get them or if you're swing trading. In our group, we've got a swing trading mechanism that is working out very well using the spies and the queues. Um, and it's it's working really nicely and we have a way to trade them so that you increase your probability of success by at least 70 to 75%. Okay. And these are quick hit trades where you're in and you're out in a week. Those are swing trades. And they're working nicely right now. But this is kind of what I'm looking at the bond market. And then, of course, interest rates are going to look just the opposite. So if we look at the 10 year rates right here, you can see we had a high point and then we rolled over. So down around this level here, I think it's going to find some stability. If we don't go into World War Three, it's going to find some stability and probably edge its way up just a little bit. Um, now, in the currency market, it's all about the dollar and the euro. Yeah, you saw what the euro stock markets were doing. They were getting crushed. OK, so first, let's look at the euro. The euro is also getting crushed. Um, you can see here on this big move, look at the volume. It's just huge volume. The purple line is over the blue. Whenever the purple line is over the blue line, the five over the 20 EMA, right? But based on volume, average volume, daily volume, this shows money is coming in and selling the euro big time. And because the U.S. dollar is not really a currency per se, but what we trade is a dollar index based on a basket of other currencies, we watch the euro because the euro is a, almost 58% of the value of the dollar. So wherever the euro goes, the dollar goes opposite. And as you can see, the euro hit a low of 1.08875 to the dollar. The futures market here so obviously the dollar probably hit highs for the year it hit 2022 lows in the euro so we could take a look at the if we go take a look at the dollar uh sure enough the dollar also hit highs up here notice the volume really um has moved up on this purple line but notice the blue line volume has been moving up the whole time the blue and the purple it's just got a steady um, uh, move higher and higher. I would be more inclined to short the dollar up at these levels and go long the euro. Now, if there is a kinetic war with NATO, a NATO country, and Russia, then this is going to go even further higher for the dollar, further lower for the euro. But if that does not happen, then I do believe we're going to see this slowly drift back down again and the euro slowly drift back up. So these would be good contrarian plays, but you got to be careful in them, guys, because if you do have that, you do not want to do naked calls up here or um, naked puts in the euro futures, right? Uh, you just want to be very careful. You want to hedge that thing as a spread if you're using options. Um, uh, because it could get ugly, all right? In fact, I favor options in this standpoint rather than the futures market or options on futures so that you can have a defined risk trade. Otherwise, you're going to get run over if the bad happens and it's going to, it could bankrupt you if you're not careful, okay? Um, and then, of course, uh, just one other thing to take a look at. If you look at the commodity sector, the DBC is a commodity index that tracks 
about 23 different commodities. And you can see this was one that we liked uh, coming out of COVID. Commodities just naturally took higher. This was uh, in early um, uh, November, but the actual uh, move out of COVID was down even lower down here. But you can see where we've just been riding this all the way up and then we expand it up here. And then you can see on this daily chart as I spread it back out again, just the amount of money and volume has flown into the commodity market. And if we go right to the 24th, this was right here. So 24, 25, when Russia started coming in, you can see the commodity index just took off. Okay. Um, there's going to be some great trades, folks. I'm going to review with our members uh, in our weekly market watch uh, this Sunday evening on commodities. So um, I think you guys will like it. If we come down here and we look at gold, well, as one of the commodities, gold also has taken off up here. Uh, I do believe gold is going to back off a little bit if things slow down uh, in Ukraine. And as long as we do not have a kinetic war with a NATO country, I think gold is going to drift higher, but we'll probably back off some of this big, huge gain here. I liked silver more than gold because silver was lagging behind. And then sure enough, silver caught up. It had a big, huge move here and made 2022 highs uh, on Friday. All right. Um, and I do believe longer term silver is going to be back up over the low 30s, but that's going to take about a year or two to get there. But it's an easier product to trade if you want to trade the ETF uh, SLV. It's a cheaper product to trade. You could do GOLD to gold, which is an ETF that tracks um, the gold market. And you can see here since the. Uh, 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 early February, it's moved from about 19 to about $24 um, a share. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 20, 30% in a very short period of time. Okay. The other one that's really taken off, we haven't traded this in a while. The last time we traded it, we made a killing in it. And I'm beginning to look at this again. Palladium hit, um, well, let's go to the palladium uh, futures first. Palladium futures is near all-time highs, right? That right there, 3,019 is an all-time high. Um, and if we go out on a weekly chart, just to show you this, palladium moves big time. You can see the last all-time high was made uh, on the 21st in May. And then the last one uh, that we traded was over here, and then it just came off the table. And it was like about $25,000 per contract, futures contract, and profits in literally just two or three weeks. So you've got the upside war risk because Russia is like 30 or 40% of the world palladium market. Or South Africa is a big piece too. They kind of fight back and forth as to who's leading in palladium exports. But this is a reason why. Uh, and this is huge. This is all-time high right up here at 3019. But when it gives it up and things slow down, this thing is going to come cratering back down again. And it'll be a great trade. So we'll watch that fairly closely. If we look at copper, this is a weekly chart of copper. You can see copper um, also took off and made new highs as well. Um, and you can look at it on a daily chart. And you can see this is just... Algos buying any and all metals, industrial metals, iron ore, uh, uh, any kind of chemicals, fertilizers, because with the high cost of energy, it's costing fertilizer companies a lot of money to leave the machines running and convert um, uh, chemicals into fertilizer. Right? It's just costing more. So everything is running up. Every commodity is running up right now. And what we want to do is pick those commodities that are extended to all-time highs and look at playing a short, but doing it in the options market so you've got a limited risk trade, right? You know your risk, which is the cost of the option contract. So we're going to watch that very closely. And look at oil, guys. If we look at oil, it closed up on Friday, $7.33. You can see this huge here, huge move on Thursday and then Friday right up in this area here. If there is a kinetic war, uh, with um, a NATO country, then you're going to see this move up to a buck thirty to a buck fifty really quickly. So you do not want to be naked short calls up in this area here, thinking you could take advantage of the call premium in the in the oil market. In fact, the estimates up here on this Elliott wave count is showing oil could move all the way up to a buck sixty um, 
uh, a barrel. Uh, it's, it's just crazy. So we're going to watch this. I think it can go a little bit higher, but I like playing it to the downside. Um, so that's a little bit about where we are on uh, oil. All right, everybody. And then one other one that we'll look at is natural gas. Nat gas is uh, running sideways here, but I do see some opportunities coming up. All right, everybody. Have a great weekend. Members, I'll see you this Sunday. Um, I'll see you this Sunday for our weekly market watch. Take care, folks. Ciao.